Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those, the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we pray, Father, as we get into these verses of Scripture, that you would just use these verses uh, to present a template, Lord, filled with principles and truth that we might be able to apply to our lives today. We want to know the truth of your Scripture to the audience that it was written to, but we also want to know these truths that can be applied to our present day and age. So, Father, I ask that the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit would just be here so that we can learn these things, rightly uh, understand them, and then apply them, Lord. And so we ask that you would do this in the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, Amen. Well, all right, we are going to look at some verses here in the book of Daniel, but we'll take a detour and go into some other verses of Scripture as well. So I want to talk about living in difficult times. So if we have that slide, we can show that. The book of Daniel, living in difficult times. You could title this several ways, living in a time of exile, which many people might not understand what that means. But if I put in difficult times, you might be able to relate to that just a little bit more. So Daniel deals with the time of the Babylonian captivity and also when the people of God are taken into exile. And so they're taken away from their homeland and brought into the land of Babylon. And so we're going to see that not only are these young men, such as Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, are taken captive before we even get there and to see what they go through and how to live a godly life in difficult times or in a time of exile or during ungodly times, I want to focus on really the first portion of chapter 1. And so it may seem like a long introduction, and that's why we probably won't get too much uh, accomplished today as far as how many verses we'll go through in Daniel. But hopefully if you understand these first couple of verses, it will paint a better picture of some of the things that I believe can be applied to our world today. So in verse number 1, it says, In the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Uh, just right there is a, a quick statement of where you're at in the book of Daniel. And sometimes as we read something in the Bible, it's a quick statement, and we say, okay, so this happened. Yes, it happened. And it almost seems like it happened suddenly, but the fact of the matter is this. When Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem to besiege it, there had been warning after warning after warning. And right off the bat, as I read these verses, one of the things that has been in my heart and been in my mind for a while is that it seems like our country is shifting towards a time where things will be harder for the Christian, harder for the believer, harder to live out a Christian life without you facing any repercussions, backlash, being canceled by the culture or anything of that nature, or just trying to live a godly life in a really pagan society. Back in our day, one of the things would happen was this. Family would move from one place to another. Say, husband got a job, wife got a job, there was a transfer. They would go to another city, go to another state. One of the things that most families would look for is like, okay, where are we going to live? That's obvious. They're going to buy a new home, live in an apartment, what side of town they're going to live on as it relates to that particular job. 
The other thing that parents would consider is, you know, if they had families, were where are the children going to go to school? That was another important factor. Is the school district good? Things of that nature. But another thing that they would consider back in the day was, is there any churches close by so that we can go to church and our family can move from city A to city B and we can continue raising up our family with good morals and values, sending our children to a good public school, but then also, is there a good church in the area so that we can continue to grow in our faith, or what I would say, to grow in our relationship with God? Nowadays, you don't really see that as part of the equation. People will just move, and they're going to move because of job opportunities. Maybe looking at schooling is another option. But last on the list is probably where are we going to go to church for many American families. God has kind of been pushed off to the wayside and not as important as he used to be. Can anybody agree to what I'm saying? That's how a lot of Americans uh, will view God and the priority of God in their lives. I say that because in verse number one, it seems like this just happened. Like Jehoiakim, king of Judah, is just reigning, and all of a sudden he's surprised that all this uh, is going on. And you have to understand that during this time there was two kingdoms in regards to the Jews. You had the northern kingdom, called the kingdom of Israel, right? The northern kingdom up here. On the south is the kingdom of Judah. They were splintered right after the days of Solomon. But what happens is this, is there there are two kingdoms, and and they're, they're both the people of God. The northern kingdom strays really fast and really quickly, and God has judged them. And despite all the warnings that are going on, Judah on the south, who has the temple of Jerusalem, you would think they would do a lot better, but they don't. And so with that, it says in verse number two, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. Into whose hands? The king of Babylon. And then it says with him, uh, some of the articles of the house of God, that's the the gold furnishings within the temple. And then it goes on to say, and and he carried them into the house, into the land of Shinar. That's uh, another way of saying Babylon to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure the house of his God. So he goes in there and he does these things. Once again, I'm going really slow this morning because these verses, verses one and two of the book of Daniel are really, really good to ponder and think about as we relate to our country, our nation, and maybe at times even our lives. So I want to go on a journey into the book of Jeremiah for a little bit. You're welcome to turn there. I don't have the scriptures, but Jeremiah is filled with warning and instruction. And the reason I want to point to Jeremiah for a little bit is because verses 1 and 2 of Daniel occur after what Jeremiah had been saying. So if we could put that on the screen, Jeremiah's warning and instruction. And I want to start off in Jeremiah 29, because many people love this verse of Scripture, where the Bible says, Behold, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? Plans for a future and a hope. And many of us love that verse because it's, it's a verse of promise, and it's an awesome verse, um, but it's also a verse that's nestled within a certain context of Jewish history. But if we go to Jeremiah chapter 29, I want to read verse 1 to you, and then I'm going to skip to verse number 4. Um, one of the reasons is there's some names that, that are kind of uh, hard to pronounce and other things in some of the verses that I skip, but in some instances, it's just to save time. So in Jeremiah 29, 11, I mean, I'm sorry, 29, verse number one, it says, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then now I'm going to read verse number four. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Remember, this is Daniel's day, right? They've been carried away captive, but Jeremiah is the prophet of the day, and he's letting us into some spiritual insights into what's happening uh, in, in normal time here. It says, verse number five, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit. It says, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. So Jeremiah the prophet is telling people, the people that Daniel will live alongside of, when this captivity happens, I don't want you to give up hope. I don't want you to give give up hope in living a life 
and living, number one, not just a life, but a life for God. I want you to continue to, to live in the midst of this Babylonian captivity. Because even though this season is coming upon the nation, and you're actually going to be carried away from the nation of, of, of Judah or the land of Judah into a foreign land, I still want you to live a godly life, and I still plan to make you successful even in a foreign place. I want to tell you, as the culture is changing in our nation, God still wants to live a holy and godly life. Amen? So you see this instruction there. But verse number 7 says, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Kind of reminds me of what, what Paul says, right? For those who are, are Christians, right? We're to pray for those who are in authority, right? For our leaders, for our, uh, city officials, for our presidents, for our congressmen and women. And even though you may not agree with them, we are still called to pray and intercede, right? Well, here's, here's the, the, the people of God who are going to be taken captive and taken into a foreign land, and they're already encouraged, hey, pray for the welfare of that city. And you're saying, how am I going to pray for the people of Babylon for its leaders if they're ungodly? Do you see how that's very similar to our day today? That even though they would be taken captive, God still commands them to be lights shining in the midst of the darkness, to still pray and intercede for people who they might consider to be the enemy so that it will go well for them. So there's already some, some good things that we can glean from these verses. But that's really not where I want to get to. Verse number 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your uh, diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to their dreams which, cause, uh, which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in, the, in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. So now we're getting into some of the things that I had mentioned last Sunday. Last Sunday, I was talking about Eli, Eli the priest, and then Samuel, a young man of God that's being raised up. And you could see that Eli and that generation, his sons, were failing spiritually. And because of their diminished spiritually, their actions morally were on display. And you saw that they were very ungodly. And that represented the, not only the decline of Eli, but the spiritual decline of the nation. So when we look at this, we see the same thing is happening right here in Jeremiah's day. It says that the people have prophets among them who are divining or looking into the future, but they're deceiving them because they are, these people are causing them to talk about certain dreams that they have because that's what they want to hear. And what is it that they want to hear? They want to hear good things only. And verse number nine says, for they've prophesied falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. In other words, what was very popular at that time, Jeremiah is saying, is that whenever a king would ask for a prophet to come, many of these false prophets would come and say whatever the king wanted them to say. If they said something good, the king was pleased with them. Life was easy for that prophet. And it seemed like, man, we, we love what this man has to say. We always want to hear from him. But then there was people like Elijah or Elisha. When the king didn't want to hear the truth, he wouldn't call for them. He was afraid that he might hear what he didn't want to hear. And I, I want to tell you something and let you in on a little secret. Do you know that there are times where people will go into a church where the word is being preached powerfully and truthfully? And as soon as that word of truth comes, some people just don't want to hear it. And they'll just move on to another church, right? And there are some churches that are afraid to speak the truth. Honestly, why? Because they are afraid that they will offend people and people will leave. That affects the church in different ways. For the pastor, it may be their ego. The more people I have in the, in the congregation, that pastor may feel like, wow, I'm really successful because I got a lot of people in this congregation. It makes me feel good about myself. On the other hand, it may be about finances and just being real. The church may have a building that they have a big loan on and they need a lot of people to come and give and things of that nature. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when's the last time I've even preached a sermon on tithing? You know, because it's not about that here, about finances and money, but is tithing and giving important? Absolutely. You will be blessed if you sow into the ministry. But you don't see that here. The main focus that hopefully you see here is the concentration that myself, Pastor Dan, or Pastor Jeff puts on preaching the Word of God and trying to do it faithfully. And in some instances, it's very encouraging. In some instances, we're confronted with the truth. And many times, people don't want to hear the truth. And in Jeremiah's day... There was all these false prophets that were rising up, just telling the kings and the people what they wanted to hear. 
And verse number 9 says, For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. And so what is happening there leads us to Daniel chapter 1. Remember when I read Daniel chapter 1, it says that the king of Babylon came and took the king of Judah captive and many people captive. And it didn't just happen overnight. What was happening, Jeremiah says, is this, is that all the while God was trying to warn you. But instead of hearing the warning, you wanted to hear these other men who would just tell you good things. Like how God wants to bless you. And is that true? God wants to bless you? Absolutely. God wants his best for you. But in the midst of that, as the people would go astray, God also raised up prophets to let them know that, hey, you're going astray. The nation is going the wrong way. There's going to be a consequence. God is going to sin and raise up the Babylonians to come and conquer. And now we read about it happening. So we say, well, that's pretty obvious. Well, not at the time, because at the time, Assyria was the dominating nation. Babylon or the Babylonians were in the background. And so all of a sudden, Jeremiah from early on is giving some news that sometimes people think, ah, I don't see that happening. We're a strong nation. It'll never happen here. That's what a lot of people say about America. We're a strong nation. We're one nation under God. It'll never happen here. But like I just mentioned moments ago, there's a lot of godlessness in this nation. And then even when you look at the church, like I mentioned last Sunday, Christianity may be a mile wide, but in most cases, it's only an inch deep. A very superficial relationship with God, more about church attendance and going to church, and it's a culture, it's a vibe, but not really a truly committed life to Jesus Christ, amen? And when that happens, our lives begin to change. I mention this often, but I'll mention it again, and I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but I like to drink coffee, but I like to put a little creamer in my coffee. Uh, have, have I drank it black before? Yes, and I've tried that, but I just, I just prefer it with creamer. So some people say that's weak, but that's just me. But there's some people who overdo it. Like I look at their coffee, and it's more creamer than coffee. So you'll tell them, do you want some uh, coffee with your creamer, right? But some people will look at adding Jesus to their life like they're just adding a little bit of creamer to their coffee. So life is just a little bit better. When God wants to give you a whole new beverage, something entirely different, we want a little bit of creamer in our coffee, but God wants something brand new. And that's why Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. You're something new, something different. The old things have passed, and behold, all things are are brand new. And so here you can see that Jeremiah is giving the warning. And in this section, once again, to understand uh, Daniel verses uh, 1 and 2, We're looking into what happened before this invasion came. So let's continue on in verse number nine. For they prophesy or they're speaking forth uh, things that God has said, which God is saying, I didn't tell them to say that. Or they're preaching sermons uh, that God didn't call them to preach. Or they're giving people false hope that God didn't give them. So in verse number 10, it says, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed At Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good toward you and cause you to return to this place. Here's something interesting to note. God is already prescribing what will happen or detailing what will happen. He says, hey, I'm going to raise up the Babylonian king. He's going to come and invade. Then he also says this, and I'm going to tell you not only who's going to do it, I'm going to tell you how long this is going to take. It's going to take 70 years, and there's a reason for that. We won't go into that. But it's going to be 70 years that you're held captive, and then that captivity is going to be over. Do you know that for some of the Jews that were living at that time, they looked at everything that was happening, and it seemed like things were out of control. But who said it was going to happen? God. God is going to allow it to happen for 70 years before it happens. Who who gave all that insight and information? God. Sometimes we look at things, and we think that our nation or everything going on in our lives is just out of control. And we're saying, like, where is God in all this? If you were a Jew in Judah and the Babylonians came in and invaded, you would say, man, where is God? Like, this is crazy. What's going on? But Jeremiah had already given the warning. All the information was there, but nobody heeded the warning. Now, let me rephrase that. Many people did not heed the warning. We have other people like Daniel, his three Hebrew friends and others who did. But for the most part, people just ignored it. And in verse number 10, it says, at the end of it, my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. And here's Jeremiah 29, 11, which most people love. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Here is an awesome, awesome promise. God knows the plans that he has for his people. Even though they're going to go into a time of exile and captivity, God eventually says, but I'm going to bring you back to the place where I destined you to be. And for the Christian, it looks a lot like that. It's almost like we're living lives in exile. We're living lives between, between uh, eternity, right? Here on earth and eternity. And eventually he's going to you know, come for us and we're going to be with him forever. And so that's a, that's a good thing. But in verse number 12, it says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And it's interesting that that's going to happen after the time of that captivity. Sometimes God will allow certain situations and problems and circumstances to hit us. And in the midst of that tribulation or trial, it actually causes us to seek God. This will cause some of the people living in that day to seek God. Because when doors start to close, when food starts to run scarce, or when things just aren't working out our way, we have a tendency at that time to call upon the Lord a little bit more than when things are going good. And then in verse... 14, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. So there's a promise of restoration. There's a judgment. There's some consequences. But at the end, God is looking to restore them and to bless them. Now, I want to take you to another place in Jeremiah chapter 5. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 5, I want to go to verse number 30. And this has to go with some of the elements that were in the verses that I read to you earlier in Jeremiah 29. So you following so far? All right. This has to do, once again, with the religious leaders of the day. And the reason Jeremiah is speaking to the religious leaders of the day frequently is because that's who God is speaking to. He's speaking to the religious leaders of the day because they have strong influence over the people of God. I want to read this to you, and it's, it's hard to read because I'm, I'm a pastor as well, and I'm part of this, this group. And I would just encourage you to pray for pastors because if, if you are in tune with anything in regards to Christian news and things of that nature, you can see that lately... A lot of pastors have been caught doing some things that are not good. Like God is exposing sin in pastors' lives, and even, even some that, like, you don't know what they did, but for whatever reason they stepped down. In other words, what's happening to those that are in ministry? Like, there's something going on. There's a shifting. There's a shaking. And so I would just encourage you as I pray, I mean, as I, as I read through these verses, and it talks about false prophets and, and ministers who are going the wrong way in the Old Testament, that it would remind us to pray for pastors and ministers of our day. Because as the pulpit begins to decline, as pastors and preachers who are supposed to be like a prophetic voice, and I don't mean like Isaiah or Ezekiel, I mean speaking forth what God would want them to say, that helps the congregation move in a Godward direction. That helps local communities, cities, states, and the nation at large. But if the pastors, the ministers, the men of God start to dwindle down like Eli, the lamp of God seems to start going out and people start walking more in darkness than they do in God's light. So I don't read these verses to like, oh man, I'm throwing stones. No, I'm reading these verses and I'm letting you know what happened in their day is happening in our day. And what are the consequences of that? The consequences are Daniel chapter 1. Babylon comes in and people are taken captive and life as you know it is no longer the same. So let's go to verse number 30. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse number 30. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. And the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And so that's the first part of those verses that I mentioned to you in Jeremiah 29, that these false prophets are prophesying falsely. They're preaching sermons that are just tickling the ears of people or giving messages that people want to hear. They don't want to hear about being confronted with their sin. They just rather go somewhere else. And, and that's why in, in some instances, not all, and I mentioned these things, and I'm not trying to put down huge or, or bigger churches, because there are some very good uh, bigger churches. 
But you know that it's easier to get lost in a big church, right? Where there's thousands of people. You can go in and out. Nobody even notices if you're gone. Usually when you're in a smaller church, you kind of recognize at least some familiar faces and hopefully know some names. And there's a little bit more of a connection and accountability. When you're missing, people notice. If you're in a church of 5,000, who's going to notice you're missing, right? And so there's not that connection. There's not that accountability. So there's very loose connections because... I'm thinking of a couple, and this couple, they, they didn't want to go to a church where they were preaching the truth, so they went to this bigger church, and that church pre- preaches some, that pastor preaches some pretty hardcore messages back in the day, and I'm like, okay, well, why is that? Well, the husband said, because we go in and we go out, and nobody connects with us, so even though he's preaching truth, she's not accountable. So do you see how people like that? That's what he says next. Look at what it says. It says, an astonishing and horrible thing, verse 30, has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? In other words, the the false prophets or the pastors or the preachers of that day enjoyed the large crowds, enjoyed the pat on the back. The people enjoyed an easy believism. Oh, I can do this, and I'm, God is still good with me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Oh, I feel good about myself, so then I'll, I'll continue. I like this guy. And that's what, that's what God is saying. There's false prophets in that day, and many of the people of that day love it that way. They wouldn't change it. And that's why they would reject people like uh, an Elijah or an Elisha, or in Jeremiah's case, a Jeremiah. Jeremiah would come with the word of God, and guess what? He didn't have many fans. As a matter of fact, I don't think you read about people like coming to Jeremiah and just being converted. Like, would you want to have that ministry? As a, as a matter of fact, in the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, God tells him, like, I'm going to make your head like, like flint, like stone, because you're going to go against some pretty hardcore people and they're going to reject you. And that's why in times they even threw him in a cistern, like, to imprison him and to leave him for dead and to give him consequences for doing what? For telling God's people the truth. That was his crime. And so if you think that's a little hard-hearted or going a little far, I want you to take a look at an instance where that happens in Jeremiah 36. So go with me to Jeremiah 36, and then we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip over to verse 20. So Jeremiah 36, and all this, once again, I'll remind you why we're doing this as you're turning, is because Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, who's going to have to live a godly life in difficult times, is experiencing what the nation rejected. They rejected God, pushed God aside. God had been warning them, and then now they are experiencing captivity and so much godlessness in their world. Why? Because they rejected Jeremiah's warning and instruction. And what did the people look like in that day? And once again, does that look very similar to what we see going on in our day? So Jeremiah 36, verses 1 through 3. You there now? All right. So it says, now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And who was the king that we were introduced to in Daniel chapter 1? Do you remember? Jehoiakim. So it's like, okay, remember, did he get caught off guard when all of a sudden he found himself and the people being taken captive? Well, no, this is one of those instances where he's been given the warning, he's been given the instruction, but he's going to just, ah, whatever. And we don't want to have that same attitude. So verse number one of chapter 36 says this, now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, That the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll or a take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. And so that it may be that those of the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I propose to bring upon them that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So God had given Jeremiah a lot of word, a lot of message, a lot of warning. And he says, take everything that I've been speaking to you about until now, 
write it on a scroll, and I want you to take it, I want you to read it, I want you to let, let everybody know about these warnings so that when they hear about these coming adversities, about the consequences, they will turn from their evil, they will repent and turn to me, and like things will be good. That would be the ideal thing, right? But I want you to see what happens. Because it's going to be read, and the outcome is not going to be what Jeremiah would hope for. After the scroll is read by Jeremiah's assistant named Baruch, some of the people are moved. Some of the officials from the king hear, and they want to let the king know, Jehoiakim, what was, what was read and about the warnings, like, hey, our nation is going south. We need to do something before we experience like God's judgment, like we want God's blessings, right? And in verse 20, it says this. I'm still in chapter 36, verse number 20. And they went to the king and into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishima, the scribe and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll. This is the scroll that God had Jeremiah write down about all the warnings, about not only the warnings, but the instruction and the encouragement. Hey, seek God. Seek God because he wants to bless you and, and stop turning towards idolatry and stop putting God off to the side, but put God first. So there's warning and there's encouragement. And if you do these things, like God's going to bless you. All of that's in the scroll. And some of us, like if it's a buffet, you only get what you want to eat and you just don't get the rest. Well, look at what happens when the scroll is going to be read. So it says in verse 21, so the king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll and he took it from Elishima, the, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood, who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns. He's reading the scriptures. He's reading the warnings. He's reading about the, the sins that the people have committed. Look at what happens. And it happened when Jehudai read the three or, four, three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king, any of his servants who heard all these words. Can you imagine that? Here's Jeremiah the prophet, like here's God's chosen man for that hour. And when he goes and he lets the king know, and all the officials that are there, as they all read this, this scroll, this scripture, on behalf of Jeremiah, on behalf of the Lord, what was the response? The king said, I don't like that. I'll tear that out. Throw it in the fire. You know that we do the same thing with God's word? I'm supposed to forgive that person. I don't like that. I'll throw that in the fire. Well, hold on to that bitterness. Hold on to that unforgiveness and see where that will take you. Well, you know what? I don't like that where it says to be holy or to have this or to do that. I'll tear that out. Throw that in the fire. Okay, well, let's see how that's going to turn out for you. Because this is the same king who got God's word and threw it in the fire, the portions he didn't like. Well, then you know what? You might as well throw it all in the fire. And that's what happened. And what happened to Jehoiakim? Daniel chapter 1. He was taken captive. When we start to pick and choose what we want from God's word, we are in very, very dangerous ground. Does that make sense? And just like the king who was in Judah, God's chosen people. He's ruling God's people. He's not exempt. Here is God's word. Here are God's commands. And he chose to tear out those portions because he's like, I don't want this. I don't want to hear that. So it wasn't just the people who loved it that way. It was even the politicians of the day who loved it that way. Man, does that sound like today? And why do I say that once again? Because Daniel chapter 1 as we look at a little bit of Daniel probably next Sunday, you need to know the context. There was already warning and instruction, warning and instruction, but the common people of the day rejected it. But even Jehoiakim, who's going to be take, taken captive, got an opportunity 
to hear the warning, to read the scroll. And yet he chose not to heed the warning from the scroll. Amen? All right, so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 7. I think this will be the last one we look at from chapter 7. I mean, I'm sorry, from Jeremiah. And then we'll go back to Daniel. So in Jeremiah chapter 7 with verse number 1, here's another thing that the people felt was a security blanket. It says in verse number 1, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. So picture the temple, right, in Jerusalem. And God tells Jeremiah, go stand there, and I want you to say these things there at the temple. Not just somewhere else, like immediately right there in the front of the temple, so people really understand the message. And then it says in verse 3, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So imagine that. Jeremiah is in front of the temple, and he's saying, Hey, everybody, God is telling me to tell you, Get right, amend your ways, and I'll let you live here. I'll let you stay in this place. This place that was promised, the the promised land. And verse uh, number 5 I'm sorry, verse number four says, do not trust in these lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. So he said, don't trust in this phrase, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Like in other words, nothing bad will ever happen to us because we are God's people and we have the temple. And God is telling Jeremiah, you tell them that don't think because the temple is here that they will be exempt from consequences in regards to the lives that they're living. Are you seeing what is happening? Go right there to the place of worship, the central place of Jewish worship, the place where God had met with his people, like Solomon, the glory of God comes down. And he says, you say from that place, don't think because you have this temple that God is just going to overlook the things that you are doing that are wrong. And don't think you can stay in this place without a consequence. That's what happens as a nation. Because remember, Daniel chapter 1, Jehoiakim is taken captive. The people are taken captive, right? They didn't heed the warning. And what does that have to do with us, once again, as a nation? Do we see that, once again, godlessness, pushing God off to the side? We only call him when we need him. But here's the thing. Not only as a nation, but as individuals. Just as people, you and me, don't just think because we come to church, that's okay. Because many people can fall into that trap. I go to church. That means I'm a Christian. No, that means so far you go to church. But there's a difference between going to church and coming to Jesus. There's a huge difference, and that goes into last Sunday's Christianity being a mile wide but only an inch deep. Christianity is much more than just church attendance. Being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus is actually following Jesus. It's not just knowing verses of Scripture. Because you can know a lot of verses of Scripture and still be far from God. I shared with our Wednesday night class and our foundations class that we have on Wednesday nights about a man that I, I, his name is Richard Owen Roberts. He knows a lot about revival, really awesome man of God. I really respect him. A lot about theology, moves of the Holy Spirit, church history, phenomenal man of God, older and wiser. Well, he has a friend, though, that he buys books from because this particular man, Richard Owen Roberts, has an extensive and very... uh, uh, how can I say, valuable library of Christian books and whatnot. Well, he deals with another person that deals with Christian books. However, this man is like a theologian. But the thing that Richard Owen Roberts pointed out about this man is he's a theologian, but he's not a Christian. In other words, he openly admits that he does not believe in God, but he likes to study theology. And the thing that really fascinated Richard Owen Roberts was this, that this man knows probably more about God than many pastors and preachers in America do. But yet he still openly says, 
You know, I, I, I don't have a relationship with God. I just study. So this man could probably preach somebody under the table, could tell probably some professors more than what they know, but yet he will openly admit, but I don't have a relationship with God. As a matter of fact, if you continue that, that conversation that uh, Richard Owen Roberts had with a person about this man, this man even went to America to seek out the best preachers, and this is what he said. He said, I went, I didn't hear any good preaching, I just heard teachers. In other words, he was expecting to be moved, and all he got was information. And that's pretty sad. Here's a man who said, okay, I'll give it a shot. I'll try to go, I'll try to go into churches, and maybe I'll have an encounter with God. But all I found was just people regurgitating information. So do you see what I'm saying? You can go to church and not necessarily come to Jesus. And these people thought, just because I have the temple, just because I have a little bit of creamer in my coffee, I'll be okay. But I remind you, Daniel chapter 1, captivity came. So do you see why I'm trying to link Jeremiah with Daniel chapter 1? This didn't just happen in Daniel chapter 1. There was warning after warning. There were signs all over the place, but people were just too busy or too blind or they just didn't care and didn't make the changes needed. And then we fall in the same situation sometimes ourselves. So verse number 4 says, Do not trust in these lying words saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, you will be, uh, for if you thoroughly uh, amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgments between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, how we relate to each other if we're loving our neighbor as ourselves, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, well, that speaks a lot to abortion there, or walk after other gods to your own hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave you, that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. And then it says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Would you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to bow, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to, we are delivered to do all these abominations? And then it says, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. So it says, how can you go out during the day and do all these things, or at night, and then come in on a Sunday morning, so to speak, and then say, hey, I'm a Christian, I love and serve the Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, this is one of those Sundays where people are not happy. But I will tell you this. I will tell you that I'm responsible to tell you things, right? And then I think of Ezekiel, like the watchman on the wall. And God tells another man of God, Ezekiel, and it has to do with the exile and the Babylonian captivity too. And if you're wondering, why is he there? Because that's where I'm at in my reading plan, but it happens to look just like our, our nation today and the church today. And so when I look at Ezekiel, he's a man that's called to deliver a message like Jeremiah is. And then when I have to talk about these things, I'm kind of put in that same situation, like, man, this is like doom and gloom, so to speak. But when God speaks to Ezekiel, he says, hey, have I not made you like a watchman on the wall who's supposed to see upcoming danger? And then if he sees the danger, you sound the trumpet and alert the people. And he said, if they don't hear the warning, if they don't hear it, they don't heed it, it's on them. But if you don't blow the trumpet, you don't give the warning, God tells Ezekiel, then it's on you. I rather walk out with a clear conscience this Sunday morning. So at the very least, that's why I'm smiling. Because why I'm smiling so that I can say, "Okay, you know, I, I did my part." And don't think that when I do this, I'm doing this to you. I'm saying, it's for me. I'm guilty of things too. There are times where I'm not walking this thing out like I'm supposed to, and I'm reminded. Don't just think, David, that you're pastoring and that you're at church and saying, oh, the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord. Like, you need to be right, too. So don't just think I'm throwing stones. No, this is for all of us. Amen? All right. So now I believe we're ready to go back to Daniel chapter 1 before we close. <laughs> all right. So now I just read two verses, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. But now you see that this is not just something that happened all of a sudden, Correct. And so if I could have the praise team join me, and I want to get ready to close with these couple of verses here. It 
So it says in Daniel chapter 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Last Sunday we were talking about the lamp in the temple growing dim. With Eli there, his eyes were dim and the lamp was burning out. And it seems as the times were getting dark, in the midst of the darkness, God calls that young boy Samuel. And you see that here's one generation who is spiritually declining. But then Samuel's put in that temple to serve. And now you see a new generation or another person coming in and says, you know what, I will seek the Lord. I will follow after him. So God always has a remnant. God always has people. But here you see that the Babylonian captivity comes, although there was warnings, there was instruction. They come to not only take people away captive, but one of the things that oppressors or people that would conquer would do, they would come and take over that temple to show that, hey, our God is more powerful than your God. And that was not true. There is only one God, the true and the living God. And people thought just because we have this temple, God would never allow that to happen. But God allowed it to happen. Because the people had drifted so far away from him. And even though he had sent them warning after warning, that was God's grace. That was God's mercy. He was telling them, amend your ways. Don't you see that what you're doing is wrong? And don't put your hope in false prophets and false sermons and just all the hype. You really need to amend your ways and get right with me and seek me. But they wouldn't. Uh, obey that. They wouldn't hearken unto that plea. And so all of a sudden, the, the temple is ransacked and those articles are taken away. And then verse number three. Then the king instructed Alshpenaz, the master of, the, of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there were no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, professing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. That when they talk about the Chaldeans or Chaldeans, you're talking about the Babylonians. It's like synonymous. It means the same thing. But what happened when Babylon came to take over? They didn't wipe out all the inhabitants. You also see that they went after a generation. They went after a lot of these young people. And what did they do? Instead of trying to destroy them, they tried to do something else. They tried to influence them. They used their culture to influence that group of young people. Are you hearing what I am saying? When they came in because the people had rejected God, when the Babylonians came in, they sought out something. And what they sought out was this. Young men, a young generation, verse number four in whom there was no blemish, that were good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand. And why did he choose them? Because they had ability to serve in the king's palace. Why destroy them when they can use them? So what did they do? They said, you know what we'll do? We'll get this young generation, and we will teach them the ways of the Babylonians. What? Yes, we will teach them the ways of the Babylonians so that way they won't be against us, they will be with us. Have you noticed what's going on in our public schools? Have you noticed what's going on in our colleges? There is this infiltration of the culture. And it's not leading people closer to God, it's leading a young generation further and further away from God with all these philosophies and ideologies that are godless. And just pulling a young generation away. It happened in Daniel's day because they forsook God. So when, Babylon, when, when the Babylonians came in, it wasn't just about war and killing people. It was about infiltrating the minds of a new generation and have them on the Babylonian side. And how does that come to be? It says in verse number 5, 
And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and wine, which he drank for three years of training for them, so that at the end of time they might serve before the king. So what did he do? Three years, kind of like you get a four-year degree, two-year associate, four-year, you know, uh, bachelor's degree. So it was schooling. They were to be schooled for three years so that at the end of three years, they would look a whole lot less like Jews and look, like a, whole, and look a whole lot like Babylonians. Does that make sense? So that they would look less like the people of God and look more like the people of the world. And I am sad to say, like seriously, like it breaks my heart. That's how many Christians are. Look so much like the world, you have to dig deep to find out they're even a Christian. Because Babylon or the ways and the systems of this world are infiltrating our schools, our colleges. And getting not only the minds of a young generation, but quite frankly, with the whole illustration or that saying, Christianity being a mile wide and only an inch deep, even in the church. And so it says that they would go through a period of training and the king offered them delicacies to entice them because this world does give enticing things. But it's all for what? Well, for the king of Babylon, it's so that you'll serve me. And that's what he would do. He would hand out things that look good. And that's what sin looks like. It looks like it's pleasurable because the Bible even says sin is pleasurable for a season. But in the end, the wages of sin is what? Death. There's that saying that sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. All those things. But the delicacies, the delicacies are thrown out there. Different vices for different people. But it says at the end of the day that all this was so that they might serve before the king. Now among them from those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names and he changes their names. We'll probably talk about this next Sunday if I have time, but just really quickly. We talked about this on Wednesday night. He changes their names here, the king Nebuchadnezzar. Kenezer does because this has to do with their identity I take you out from where you live I put you in this environment now I'm going to change your name change your identity forget who you are forget where you came from start to mold you and shape you and all of a sudden you, you see these young men Daniel and his three Hebrew friends with an opportunity to capitulate and to give in. But you're going to read in the book of Daniel that these young men refuse to bow. And the first thing they do is they refuse to eat from the king's table, from those delicacies. I will not take that. Their parents are nowhere to be found. They were separated and singled out because the king wanted potential in his arena so that they might serve him. And all of, all of a sudden, he finds that these particular young men, they refuse. Because you may take me out of Judah, and the temple may be destroyed. And you may place me in Babylon, and you may offer me things to try and tempt me and lure me. But these young men had the courage to say, but I will not. I will not bow. I may live in an ungodly time, in an ungodly society, but I will not bow down to the culture. I will remain faithful to God. And this is without their parents around. If there was ever a time where parents need to really be instructing their children in the ways of the Lord, it is now. Because how many of our children would respond to that in that manner? How many of us would respond to that in that manner? And so Daniel and his three Hebrew friends are going to live in a difficult time, and we'll get into that next Sunday. But at least you got introduced to chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Father, we come before your presence, and we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who 
gives instruction from your word, gives warning from your word. And just like we read about the captivity that would take place in Daniel chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, it didn't happen suddenly, it happened slowly, like erosion, little by little by little. And then they found themselves, the people of Judah, in a place of defeat and captivity. But it doesn't have to be that way. You offered them a way of escape. You offered them the blessing of repentance. And Lord, today as we stand here this afternoon, I pray, Lord, if there's any areas in our lives where there's been erosion, where maybe we haven't been heeding the warnings, the warning light has come on, but we've ignored it. There's portions of scripture that we know of, but we tear it out and we throw it in the fire like King Jehoiakim. But today, Father, we pray that truly that the light would come on in our hearts and in our minds and we would be able to see areas of our lives that need to be readjusted, refocused, reprioritized so that we might align ourselves, Lord, with your purpose, with your will, with your word. That we might, like Jeremiah said, amend our ways so that we may live in the promised place of blessing that you have for us. So, Lord, this afternoon, as we respond to you and to your word, let there be a time of healing, a time of strengthening, a time of deliverance, Lord, from things that may hold us back. So we give this time to you. If we could stand, and then what I want to do is just have an opportunity for us to respond to the Lord. And there's nothing special about this altar, but there is something special about us taking a step of faith. And what I mean by that is this, is that all of us and every one of us